Yeah, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Ryder Cuttle, and I'm a professor and deputy director here at IIPP. And uh, I um, yeah, warmly welcome you in this seminar. I think we are. Uh, we can just wait for a minute or two for um, for people to to join in uh, for the seminar. And as people are joining, I will um, do a very quick uh, introduction to the seminar series, and also I will uh, I will quickly introduce our our speakers. But yeah, I see that the number of people participants is gradually increasing. So I think people are still joining or from their morning coffees or wherever you are. Maybe you have an afternoon tea or you're in the middle of a lunch. Uh, in any case, uh, welcome. And um, just to, by way of background, so this uh, this is a, a, a first uh, of three seminars workshops around evaluation evaluation of transformative uh, mission oriented uh, system change oriented policies and we will have uh, two more seminars and um, coming up in one in may and one in june so please do check our our website if you are interested in, in signing up on those as well and we very much um, encourage you to, to do so as this is supposed to be a a community building exercise in terms of people, academics, policy practitioners, anybody interested in in this space is, is very welcome to to join. Um, bring your own experiences, bring your own um, uh, bring your own uh, yeah questions uh, and, and all that. So you're very welcome to do to join the the other events as well. Uh, so um, we have today three speakers. Uh, initially, I will do five minutes. Why are we here? Kind of introduction. Then we have a, a Oris Conan, uh, uh, who's a professor at Western uh, Norway University of Applied Sciences, uh, followed by Ines Stemann, uh, who's an associate professor here at UC UCL at our sister department, Steeps in Sciences. And uh, last but not least, we have um, Juan Mateos Garcia, currently, currently from DeepMind, uh, but he will talk about his previous work in um, in Nesta about um, policy evaluation. So I think I'll, I'll quickly share my screen so I can do a, a very brief introduction. Oh, that's, um, okay. I hope I'm sharing the right screen. Uh, seems to be so. Anyway, so as you see, the, the idea of this uh, series of workshops is around um, you know, how do we evaluate mission-oriented, transformative, uh, challenge-oriented? There is uh, many names for these kind of policies. How do we evaluate those policies and what is the emerging practice that we can all, as academics, as policymakers, learn from? And as you know, the, this sort of emerging generation of mission-oriented policies, it's a very wide landscape. So you have both public organizations like the European Union, uh, very strongly engaging with mission-oriented policies and, and very strongly also led by our own ins institute and the work of Mariana Mazzucato. But you also have lots of uh, um, uh, non-profit organizations like Nesta here at the bottom. You see private organizations, the X Prize since already a couple of decades, but even private businesses like here, a tweet from Boston Consulting Groups is showing why companies need to do more than just be driven by profit. This, so there is this very wide landscape of these kind of mission-oriented innovations and policies emerging. And of course, they're all somehow driven by this idea that we need more ambitious goals. We need to have much more systematic change in, in a lot of our policy areas from climate change to inequality, to how do we build cities? How do we think about health? All of those areas are really covered. And there is this, uh, a famous quote by uh, Hyman Minsky, who, who was a, a very influential economist in, in 1980s and 1990s around finance mainly. But he used to jokingly say that there are as many varieties of capitalism as Heinz as pickles. And as I'm sure all of you know, Heinz has 57 types of pickles uh, here, uh, if you have been using Heinz and ketchup. And I think we can we can really say that the same thing happened with, has happened with missions as well. There is really a, a huge variety of missionary policies being uh, rolled out and implemented by governments on all levels, from local governments, from local councils, and um, to European Union, 
and, and uh, all the national governments in between. Even you know, already a few years ago, when the European Union did a, a sort of an inventory of mission oriented policies, they, they found more than 138 um, examples. And I'm sure by now, this as a library of these kind of policies has increased very, very rapidly. This, of course, tells us that, that is the, while the practice of mission oriented policies is, is, is extremely diverse, it also makes uh, so evaluation practices, of course, also quite difficult and, and challenging because there is no such thing as doing missions in one and the correct way. There's multiple ways missions are being used from, as I said, from health um, to knife crime to, to, to circular economy and so on and so forth. So there's a variety of practice out there. <clears throat> and so we can argue that mission-oriented or challenge-oriented policies really are um, sig signifying this kind of a normative turn in policies that we go away from from policy rationales that are focusing on competitiveness or market fixing and very much horizontal policies that are sort of agnostic about the goals of policies in terms of what are the what is the direction of change are we you know generating more green solutions are we generating more equitable solutions to more actually consciously trying to shape markets for specific outcomes either emissions or whatever we want to call them so there is this a normative turn as it were that a lot of policymakers are put into and here, here's an example from, a, from our work five years ago already, where we sort of try to um, summarize what does it mean for the evaluation. So if you go from so evaluating whether you're, you're actually solving a specific market failure or a government failure uh, or a system failure or whatever we want to call, but you focus on fixing that failure, which is kind of something that you can hopefully measure, there is this risk involved and you can actually try to calculate what that is. But if you go toward much more open-ended policies I and mean market shaping policies, you're actually needing to have much more reflective and ongoing process rather than thinking you have um, a certain um, you know, failures that you have fixed. And so this of course necessitates a, a very different kind of practice. And I think the, the question that we're starting to, or trying to answer today and in, and in the follow-up uh, seminar series is really whether we actually, this sort of the, normative turn does it also need to be accompanied by an epistemic turn so how do we know what is a good policy result how do we evaluate that policy and and of course you are already historically we know that this was the challenge with the first generation of mission oriented policies from the space race in 1960s and 70s this is a famous book by richard nelson um, and one of the leading innovation economists um, from the last century and, and and this one as well and he wrote this uh, famous essay around the moon and the ghetto that why are we able to, uh, to send a man or a woman uh, to the moon and bring them back? But why are not, not, why are we not able to solve the problem of kettles in, 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 even in very, very highly developed countries? And of course, his challenge was, um, or his argument, or part of the argument was that the way we know, excuse, the way we analyze poverty and other social problems and the way we know about them is very different from the way we analyze technological uh, problems. And that is, <clears throat> I think, still the challenge with us. Do we need the new epistemic tools? And here is an example of, from Vinova, which is an uh, uh, innovation agent in Sweden, and we'll hear more about Vinova today in the, in the first presentation. But <clears throat> this sort of, what does it look like to do a, a try, to try to do an epistemic turn in, in policy evaluation? And I think if you look at the sort of largest bubble of, uh, of their envisioned work around mission oriented policies is very much around having lots of demonstrators lots of small projects experiments and learning from them but of course if you have lots of uh, projects that are trying to do the same thing or trying to experiment in the same space around streets or food or whatever the mission is you obviously have something of a challenge how do you actually measure that impact and how do we get away from sort of annual measurement of KPIs and are we actually uh, reaching those targets or not? And that, of course, makes it even more challenging because the process, the, the process itself becomes as important as actual sort of quantitative outcomes. And here's an example from our own work. So how do we get away from this thinking of waterfall type of policy or waterfall type of policy evaluation that we think about policy for years, we design it for years, we have a big program, it goes out to the world, and then we start to measure it in a couple of years. So how do we go away from this kind of waterfall? And here is a, a sort of a, a spin on the, on the Winnow work that, that we are um, doing at the moment with Innovate UK, which is in UK's 
innovation agency where we all sort of you go from a, a challenge to a mission and you actually try to build a, a, a coalition of actors around that mission so it's, it, it cannot be only a public private, uh, public sector actors it has to be a coalition of stakeholders and you 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 aim at system systemic change and you build sort of a, a lots of various activities and uh, and actions and, and targets into that and the experimentation and learning are really the sort of the key element that actually feeds back into the mission building itself so you always kind of try to work missions as a PETA version so that you don't have a a final version of that and so this is really from our perspective why we have lots of changes going on within the system so sort of just capturing these lessons on the system level requires an alternative approach or pro, uh, alternative approaches <clears throat> so we, we go from sort of program to system linear to dynamic feedback loops top down to more participative co-creation co of, of monitoring and evaluation short versus longer term how do we get away from one year or, or even two year budget cycles and so on and so forth but also the sort of the ownership question who owns the mission orientation and all uh, uh mission oriented evaluation so this is kind of the idea of this uh, building a community around experts and practice around how do we evaluate these emerging practices of of experimentation and what are the lessons that we can take from that and uh, what are the practices we can we can take from that so this is really we want to gather experts we want to gather insights we want to create a community and we, we want to nourish that community so that policymakers and academics can share their experiences and learn from that as i said we have three uh, three sets of uh, seminars one is today then we have another one in may 17th and uh, and uh, and the last one in june so please register um, and come and come and join us um, in creating this community. And last but not least, this is an effort by our uh, new policy studio, and uh, this is a, a collaborative space where we where we bring together policymakers and practitioners to really to test uh, the new solutions and see what actually works uh, out there. So this is a very briefly quick introduction from myself, and and now we will go and hear from three experts in the field, uh, three experts from very kind of different fields and and then each of them has a 15 minutes uh, for the presentation and uh, after that we have a half an hour uh, session of Q&A um, um, led hopefully by you you the audience so but if you have questions comments please drop them in the in the chat already so we try to keep it as um, as uh, discursive as possible so our first presentation comes from uh, Lars Conan, as I already mentioned. Um, Lars is a, is a professor at Western uh, Norway University of Applied Sciences and also uh, at Oslo University, and previously from Lund, Melbourne, uh, uh, sort of uh, many stops in his academic career. Lars' focus is, is really on economic geography, so he has done excellent work in, in regional innovation systems, systems and really one of the cutting edge thinkers in that space. And he will talk about the Vinova, as I already mentioned, one of the leading agencies in this, in this space, both in terms of uh, transformative change, but also mission oriented policies. So floor is yours, Loris, and thank you for, for joining us. Thanks, Rainer. I'll start by sharing my slides. There we go. Um, yeah. Okay, uh, yeah, so thanks so much for organizing this event, um, which is um, extremely timely, I think. Um, and I will talk about indeed the sort of the practices of monitoring and evaluation um, by the Swedish Innovation Agency, Vinova, uh, in the space of their turn towards transformative innovation policy and missions. Um, while I'm right now uh, in Bergen, in Western Norway, um, this basically goes back also to my previous uh, engagement with Vinova back in the days in, in Lunds, uh, where I was working at Circle, and Circle was um, also working closely together with Vinova, was funded by Vinova, was in a sense sort of a, an embedded uh, research institute doing a lot of um, policy uh, relevant work. Um, and this work is basically based on a paper that's at the moment published in science and public policy 
um, based on a collaboration with Harald Rohracher from Linköping University and Olga Kordas from the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm. Um, and I, I should sort of disclose that I, I'm not a, um, a technical expert on monitoring and evaluation. Um, as Reiner already said, I'm, a, I'm an economic geographer, do my work on um, geographies of innovation, geographies of innovation policy. Um, but I, I'm very interested in this turn towards missions, the normative turn on innovation policy. And um, I think that th there's a lot for us to do in terms of engaging more with monitoring and evaluation, because that tells us a lot about what really is going to happen in terms of that paradigm shift that um, that we are potentially in the midst of, whether that is really going going to unfold. Um, as as Reiner already mentioned in the in the in the introduction, this is this is a very wide landscape. Um, even though I think sort of the the, the dominance of, of Mariana Mazzucato's work uh, sh should really be acknowledged that a lot of people, scholars, practitioners are really looking at the work in London at IIPP ab ab about missions. It's, it's, it is very influential. Um, and, but in, at the same time, there is, of course, also um, other work by, for example, people like uh, Johan Scott and Steinmüller about transformative innovation policy. Um, but but what they're all sort of also have in common is sort of this idea that we're really facing a paradigm shift uh, beyond sort of the previous paradigm of innovation systems geared to innovation for competitiveness, for economic growth, uh, and a stronger engagement with directionality towards solving large societal challenges. Um, so sort of the, the rationale, the purpose of innovation policy is, is broadening up. Um, and this is very interesting because that is also reconfiguring then sort of the powers, capabilities, responsibilities in, in the governance of innovation. And again, um, at IIPP, I think a lot of that work is then sort of predicated on the idea of the entrepreneurial state. Um, and I guess it's it's these are very big and bold ideas. Um, and um, I'm personally very sympathetic to them, working a lot in the space of sustainability transitions, where also directionality of innovation has become a, a very important theme. Um, but at the same time, big ideas also um, sort of provoke a lot of criticism and provoke sort of, you know, um, other views. Um, and I think it's important to also sort of acknowledge these, these criticisms um, uh, in a sense to sort of improve our thinking and our practices around, uh, around missions. So that's why I wanted to sort of start off with also noting some, some challenges in the space of mission policy. And that is, first of all, perhaps that people have been pointing out that even though the idea with missions is to target societal challenges, in practice, it still leads to a lot of sort of ideas around technological fixes and solutionism, uh, where sort of the, the, the technology runs ahead of actually understanding uh, the, the problems it seeks to, to address and, the, uh, you know, the idea of, of wicked problems that are often targeted by missions. Reiner already mentioned uh, Dick Nelson's famous work on the moon and the ghetto. Um, second point is that missions are perceived to be um, top down. Um, have provoked criticisms of sort of democratic deficits. Uh, again, that's maybe partly in the way that it's practiced, not necessarily in the way that uh, sort of it, it's been written in, in the theory. Um, so or a third criticism is that um, because it's, um, it's based on a lot of thought leadership, um, it could also lead to sort of a one size fits all sort of thinking around missions, even though, as Reiner said, we see that it is increasingly sort of pluralizing how, how missions are being designed, developed, and implemented. Uh, but still, I, I, th I think there are tendencies also in the policy landscape for kind of fast-track policy mobility, uh, leading to sort of ceremonial um, uh, approaches to, to missions and transformative innovation policy. I think a fundamental sort of problem or challenge um, that, that relates to those sort of three previous challenges is that we still have relatively sparse and selective empirical evidence around sort of the impacts uh, and sort of the processes 
of a mission-oriented innovation policy. Um, and as a result also of that sort of lack of empirical evidence, we also have still challenges in terms of how do we uh, implement missions in, um, in, in, in effective ways. Um, let us now turn then to the empirics and look at the case of Sweden um, as a, a clear case of a protagonist of uh, next generation innovation policies and most recently then a turn to missions and transformative innovation policy. Sweden is of course a, as a nation uh, considered an innovation leader. It tends to be in the top three of the European Innovation Scoreboard, the Global Innovation Index, um, and obviously in, in uh, Vinova, the Sweden's National Innovation Agency, plays an important, uh, a crucial role, a central role in uh, Sweden's innovation policy. Um, the agency has a budget of approximately 250 million euros annually. It has about 200 employees and typically is a front runner in adopting sort of new style policy paradigms. Um, in, at its inception, in, uh, Vinova was the Sweden's in, in, a state agency for innovation systems. So it was one of the sort of the first movers to really um, apply a systems perspectives on uh, innovation policy. Um, that has fallen out of fashion. And recently Vinova has been sort of renamed more neutrally as Sweden's innovation agency. But we could still see that among sort of the uh, national innovation agencies in, 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 in OECD countries, um, Vinova is really sort of a front runner also when it comes to uh, mission thinking and mission practice and has recently also published a book reflecting on their experiences with missions uh, um, um, uh, edited by, by Dan Hill, who used to also be, of course, at IIPP. Um, and I think an important thing to, to, to note with Vinova is that it's both a funder, but it's also an intermediator in the innovation system and an important analyst of innovation in uh, Sweden. And uh, as sort of a boundary object um, for that sort of multiple role that Vinova plays in the uh, innovation landscape, um, there's the so-called Effect Logik, um, Vinova's uh, impact assessment portfolio, um, which is sort of a, a necessary condition for all programs and projects that, that Vinova funds, um, which is, is basically that any sort of program uh, and project states ex ante um, its goals, uh, how it's going to measure its goals, um, how, what its sort of theory of changes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but it's important to note that that sort of effect logique, that impact assessment portfolio is heavily based on a summative evaluation uh, philosophy. It basically draws on um, a, a positivistic epistemology, um, very much based on quantifiable indicators, patterns, publications, um, you know, uh, tangible uh, innovations, new startups, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the method is primarily used um, as a sort of generic template that can be used across all programs, all projects of Innova, and geared to benchmarking, to comparison internally between projects, between programs uh, in Vinova, but also um, internationally. So it very much sort of serves a, a, the purpose of accountability and its, its theory of change um, is born really out of ex ante defined cause effect relations. Now, um, that tool or that philosophy um, is running into problems um, with Vinova's turn to missions. And we sort of, Observe that in uh, one of their kind of uh, central mission programs, the Strategic Innovation Programs, SIPs in shorts, um, which are very ambitious, um, well-funded uh, innovation programs at Finova that are geared to sustainable solutions to global societal challenges and increased international competitiveness. So you always see it's sort of a hybrid between challenge-driven and still sort of more traditional innovation policy. Um, they're transformative. Um, they have a long time horizon of about 12 years, but they're also very decentralized. They draw on innovation agendas, visions, missions that really come from the sector that are not sort of set up by government, but that are set up by typically sort of quadruple helix stakeholders, industry, academia, uh, government and civil society. And um, 
the, the monitoring and evaluation practices of the strategic innovation program has been heavily subjected to contestation and disputes as there was sort of an, an unfolding tension between summative and formative approaches to monitoring and evaluation. And that partly also has to do that some of the strategic innovation programs were more or less typical still sort of industry-based uh, supply-oriented uh, innovation uh, support programs, while others were really sort of much more geared to um, demand-oriented, societal challenge-oriented uh, uh, innovation programs. Um, so we could really see that um, how to monitor and evaluate those, those SIPs. Um, there was tension between what's the purpose of monitoring and evaluation? Is it about leveraging control and accountability, or is it really about learning, about reflexivity um, uh, around, around the program? Um, what means and, and, can, and methods can we use to, to monitor and evaluate? Do we have to draw on proven methods? Or can we experiment with, with novel approaches and also draw, for example, on qualitative methods? Um, who should be monitoring and evaluating? Should it be sort of objective, distanced agents? Or can actual participants, stakeholders in the innovation programs um, monitor and evaluate themselves? And there were tensions in, in terms of temporality. Um, is sort of the monitoring and evaluation short term? you know, punctuated through stage gates, or is it a sort of continuous process? Is it sort of really geared to uh, long-term transformative uh, changes? Now, one of the um, SIPs that we then particularly focused on, uh, and which was much more really geared to societal challenges, is Viable Cities. Uh, a SIP that was uh, focused on climate-neutral sustainable cities. Its mission is climate-neutral cities in 2030 with a good life for all within planetary boundaries. Um, a budget of 150 million euros, um, 130 members from typically the quadruple helix, and I'll come back to that in a bit. An important sort of institutional innovation has been uh, the establishment of climate contracts um, within this. Um, at the moment, 23 municipalities across Sweden uh, are participating in viable cities. Um, and uh, just to sort of lay out some of the complexities for monitoring and evaluation in viable cities, it really has a very diverse portfolio of interventions at multiple scales. So it is really about um, products to achieve um, um, zero carbon uh, urban transitions, um, new sort of urban services, uh, new policy planning approaches, new storytelling uh, around cities, um, it is changed across multiple levels. It's the level of the street, um, but it's at the level also of districts. It's at the level of entire cities, and it's at the level of, uh, of, of the entire country. And then um, because it really engages with the notion of sort of climate transition, it also seeks to capture a range of outcomes, not just sort of climate neutrality, but also issues of social justice, health security, and employment. Um, typically. It's it, because it's around cities, they are very concerned with also how do we um, include citizens um, as innovators um, in, in, in this program, uh, but also that sort of um, innovation, low carbon innovation in cities is, is governed not just at the level of a city, but heavily also by what is happening at other levels of government. Um, but at the same time, that sort of the the, 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 the configuration of stakeholders, the partnerships are uh, susceptible for, for changing and changing quite radically. As we are thinking around, for example, issues of urban mobility, we really see that sort of new sort of coalitions are emerging that are really thinking around sort of new uh, constellations of, of, of urban transports, uh, which completely sort of reframe, reframe also the, the mission of, of, of uh, urban climate neutrality. Now, um, viable cities then sort of tried to resolve those tensions with formative and summative um, monitoring and evaluation practices. Um, thanks, oh, thanks. Yeah. Through their, what they call their transition lab, which was really um, geared to diagnostic monitoring. And, and, and Reiner already mentioned it as well. Um, here, the emphasis is really on sort of experimentation, experiments, 
maybe even more so than innovation. Um, and the, the term experiments is sort of consciously chosen uh, not to sort of uh, subscribe to sort of a, a more unidirectional linear idea of, of, of innovation to achieve missions, but rather to interrogate, negotiate missions. Um, acknowledging also that when you're working in the space of, 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 of climate neutral cities, there are a lot of sort of synergies and trade-offs um, between sort of different innovation projects. Uh, again, typically sort of, you know, faced by in, in uh, due to the, the wickedness of, 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 of the challenge. Um, and also using the notion of experimentation to much more give space for uh, learning from failure. So simply counting, um, you know, innovations um, is, is, is really, um, th th does not really cut it here. Um, learning is integrated um, in projects um, and um, within sort of the innovation portfolio of the participating cities. And again, um, this is, I think, interesting, as, as Reiner mentioned earlier on, you know, um, in an epistemic turn, um, subscribing, in a sense, to, to a realist epistemology. So accounting both for sort of necessary structural cause-effect uh, relationships, but also acknowledging for contingency and, and context, as you have to uh, account for the fact that you're dealing with cities like Stockholm, Gothenburg, Malmö, but also with, with lesser sized cities and uh, the contextualities of these cities uh, is really important in order to draw lessons from, from monitoring and evaluation um, uh, innovation projects. Um, so in terms of the, the techniques for monitoring and evaluation, it's, it's typically more pluralistic both qualitative and quantitative, but importantly, really sort of with um, co-creation processes involving uh, involving stakeholders and, you know, really uh, subscribing to the idea that it has to be uh, reflexive and uh, subject to sort of developmental learning. Um, I already mentioned the idea of the, um, the, 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 the climate contracts. So the innovations then really become sort of projects um, that, that serve as test beds, system demonstrators. Um, there's a lot that can be learned from that, um, but these test beds and system demonstrators are also then tied to investments decisions. And that, that is then sort of institutionalized through these climate contracts where mayors typically sort of make sort of binding agreements with other state authorities um, in terms of their climate performance, their climate uh, transitions, um, but where also then those kind of climate contracts based on sort of the outcomes and the monitoring and evaluation of the exper experiments where they get kind of recalibrated on a yearly basis, um, but also to avoid sort of the projectification that there is this whole portfolio of innovation projects going on and it, it, there's, a, there's a huge risk that this becomes very piecemeal. So in that sense, they really try to kind of leverage the impact through these uh, climate contracts. So to, to rapidly sort of conclude, um, we see that Sweden and Vinova um, in its policy rationales and objectives is increasingly becoming mission heavy. Um, but at the same time that there is a sort of a methodenstreit, uh, methodenstreit uh, between summative and, and formative approaches, where um, still a lot of the sort of the mission oriented policies tend to be evaluated through, uh, through summative uh, approaches. Um, and in that sense, this then calls really attention to something which I, I find still is somewhat sort of weakly developed in the literature around missions about what is really meant with, with, with experimentation. And I think um, our case really um, draws attention to that experimentation is sort of another side of the coin um, around sort of the ambitions and the directionality of, of, of missions and experiments are sort of the necessary counterpart to enact, interrogate, and importantly also contest missions. So they don't become this sort of top-down uh, beast for, for, for which it is sometimes criticized. Um, and that then 
and I think that kind of really follows also from our case focusing on, on cities, implies greater attention for how missions uh, operate in, in, in the sphere of, uh, of multi-level governance. I'll leave it there. Thanks for your attention. Thanks so much, Lars. Excellent uh, summary of the Swedish case. And I, I see from the chat that we have uh, people from Binova and also Viable Cities uh, joined us. So maybe we, if, if there is a, a, any specific questions around that, I already see some emerging. Uh, yeah, as you say, this is a one of the leading cases in terms of experimenting also with, uh, with uh, evaluation and that there is a lot to learn from. So what we now go uh, to our second speaker. And we come back to, to Lars and uh, take the discuss the questions. Our second speaker is um, yeah from from UCL, uh, Ina Stemans. Um, uh, Ina is associate professor in futures analysis and policy, so a great area to work on uh, and uh, the terrific title I think. And she has uh, recently uh, worked, uh, for instance, around evaluative capabilities with the UAE Space Agency and other. A similar um, sort of issues uh, also in the UK government um, yeah, the re recently renamed, I think, <laughs> Department for Industry. Uh, so Ina will talk about um, her uh, her thinking in this space and uh, yeah, also for 15 minutes. So welcome, Ina, and uh, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Werner, and um, thank you so much, Lars. A pleasure, everyone, to be here. And um, Lars, what a presentation to follow. I think you're going to hear some similar observations from me. Although uh, I'm going to emulate Lars and just sort of explain a little bit how I come into it, because it, it's going to probably help give some context to for I'm, why I'm taking a slightly different angle. Um, so, well, now there's two of me on the screen here. There's me there in the bottom, but so that I could sort of give the context that my general work, my wider interests, they are about looking at the way that policy teams, so that's not to exclude anyone, but I'm especially interested in like public, national, local administrations, and how teams within those administrations do analysis and complex analysis. So I look at their competencies and their skill sets and their methods. Um, and I have this particular interest in the skills and tools and methods you need and the resources you need to do analysis on policies that have very long-term time dimensions. So that's the futures part and that are cross-cutting in terms of domains or sort of policy sectors, which means that in the last few years, um, a huge subset of the cases and the partners I've worked with has been on mission-oriented policies, some explicitly so, like here in the UK and in the UAE, the two cases I'll especially draw on, uh, and some um, implicitly, uh, when you sort of frame them, they turn out to be missions informed, uh, sort of guiding principles and thereby directionality, but they may not have been framed in that way. Um, I wanted to sort of ask from the panelists to sort of to contribute to this first seminar in terms of what's the current state, like what have we not just ourselves worked with, but what have we observed in terms of current challenges and methods and tools that are used in evaluating missions. Um, I, I'm not going to do much about the specific cases. So as, as I sort of share my, my summary of observations and lessons learned with partners, um, these come specifically from work on collaborating directly with, um, so these are sort of like first, first-hand uh, partnerships with policy teams. So um, on Rainer, unlike your presentation, um, this is not including businesses in the same way um, or uh, consultancies in, 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 in terms of like their, their ways of working. Specifically, I'm drawing on four uh, cases that are working with four ministries and agencies um, delivering public services. The majority have been in the UK. Marina said it was our former Ministry for Energy, um, Industrial Strategy and Business. Um, our, in the UK, we also have an Office for Product Safety and Standards, and then with the UAE Space Agency, um, all sort of ongoing. So I hope if, if you're wondering where from these observations on methods, it's a very UK, UAE informed um, set of perspectives. So hopefully some interesting similarities, but contrasts with the Swedish experiences. Uh, as well, the time period is incredibly similar. It's the last five years or so that all these, um, um, the data has come from. So I'm gonna begin with my conclusion, which is that if the question is, you know, from what we know, how can we, if we're looking to not only evaluate missions, but transform that so find ways to make it better aligned the tools that we use with our various purposes formative and summative and evaluating missions what are sort of my two uh higher level observations or or areas principles that i feel can sort of inform our um, ways of directing action the first is that when we think about 
how to do evaluation and, and better align it with mission-oriented evaluation, the, our, our treatment of action to support that has to be multi-level. And what I mean with that is evaluation is shaped by what happens at the very high level, like ecosystem. So this is how do ministries or departments or policy units, like what kind of resources and power do they have to undertake evaluation? So how can they uh, perform? Um, there is related to that, but separately, the actual capabilities of the groups within those organizations. So looking at the sort of more team level, what is it in terms of the tools and methods and processes, the kind of requirements they have for how to undertake evaluation, other reporting structures that exist um, that sort of structure that. And then within that, we have the individuals. So to understand the evaluation of missions, we have to look at not only what are the methods, but also what skills do you need? What knowledge do you need? And at the individual level, but maybe also collectively across multiple individuals. And so my, my first observation is that recurrently, we sort of see that there's definitely the understanding that evaluation and evaluation of missions involves support and governance and action at all of these levels. But the understanding in terms of how, for example, investment in an individual's competencies for mission evaluation it's un, the, the, the linkages with how that fits with the group's capabilities or the, the wider institutional capacities, that's much less clear. So we sort of treat uh, like, okay, we're going to provide some training and missions-oriented evaluation. And there isn't then that explicit connection in terms of and how our wider organizational developments align with that to support, to sort of um, better align our, our approach to evaluation overall with missions. So the first is all action really should bear in mind this is that multi-level and, and Lars used uh, very similar language in multi-layered. And the second is that while we hear very much talk about evaluation of missions, the capabilities and competencies that you need, they are, uh, I've called them coupled because it was a nice alliteration, but it's the, the summary is that to only talk about evaluation then misses that there's this blind spot. You can't do the what is required for evaluation of missions without the competencies and capabilities for data science, for um, like appraisal of complex hybrid evidence. And that when we work with partners, we often see that sort of we'll really put the attention on evaluation and then find that there are all of these gaps and very closely coupled capabilities that then become challenges or barriers that we need to deal with. So this is the sort of summary of where I'm gonna go. And I wanna illustrate these two separate uh, multi-level capabilities, perspectives and um, a uh, couple uh, capabilities for you with some examples and going into the issues. I, I, I also want to say, I, I, uh, if, if you're listening, you may be like, well, a lot of this seems very intuitive in terms of going through some of the issues faced um, and very, um, not just prevalent, but they've been historically ongoing. So many of the issues we face in missions evaluation, they are the issues we face in evaluation and complex evaluation <laughs> um, overall. Um, and I don't think that that sort of diminishes the significance of within a missions oriented policy world to really just engage with those directly, because there is just no way that we can do the kind of ambitions we have for missions oriented evaluation without directly engaging with all of these. Okay, so what are some of the, the issues and some of the options that we have or like emerging practices that we're seeing? This is very abstract representation of the way that a golden missions policy intervention with a fat arrow acts in a world and, and missions uh, we'd expect to see outcomes over time that relates to a wide variety of things you know whether it be um, a reduction in climate change emissions or uh, changes in consumption patterns um, uh, the way that we produce goods um, changes in international relations at nation state level across uh, between cities for example and so um, one or two of our first challenges are that when we evaluate uh, the way that missions are designed, implemented, ongoing, and the kind of outcomes generated, first we need evaluation tools that are capable of having that cross-sectoral scope. It is by definition for a mission, unlikely you're only going to be focusing on uh, industrial production and not in manufacturing and not be looking at household uh, consumption and lifestyle behaviors, nor uh, the relationships with science, technology, innovation uh, sectors in the same academia. So we need, what we need is a, an approach and evaluation that allows for multiple systems. Now, I don't know how many of you have worked in evaluation, but many of the tools we um, mostly use tend to be very focused at 
breaking things up into sectors and taking an approach by considering um, actions, impacts, benefits, costs. You can see some of the language there that happens within sectors, looking at different inputs and outputs and then aggregating those to a summative level. And so what we lose are the, the actual relationships of influence that go across. So this is one sort of um, area for work that is ongoing, but it's taking a more systems-based approach in developing the methodologies for evaluation. And I'll try and bring in an example in a moment. The second is actually what we measure, what we observe, what we capture data on tends to be incredibly biased towards the things that um, are countable and that have some kind of economic value. Now at the IPP uh, and with colleagues, this is very well understood that our, percent, our understanding and valuing needs to be much broader than that. But when we look at the tools that we use in evaluation, overwhelmingly, they are biased towards the counting of economic costs and uh, costs, benefits and value. Um, there are methodologies that look at other types of outcomes and, and collecting data on those and measuring them, like changes in willingness to cooperate, uh, increased trust in government, um, a, the development of entrepreneurial spirit that is sort of going to be a long-term enabler of what missions-oriented policies are looking to do. But those are much less common and much less well-known and discussed. Two more challenges, um, as if there weren't enough, is that when it comes to uh, the nature of missions um, and how they work and therefore how we can continuously evaluate them is that they work in a world where there are lots of other activities ongoing, lots of other policies. For example, if we have a missions oriented policy on uh, net zero, um, the reducing of carbon emissions for industrial sectors, there will be many other behaviors that are potentially reducing uh, emissions that were not directly at all related to the original um, articulated missions policy. From an evaluation point of view, the challenge is then knowing um, sort of on what premises you make your claims. How can you disentangle the different contributions, different policy actions and non-policy actions make to the longer term outcomes that you have of interest? For that, there are evaluation methodologies increasingly, only really in the last 10, 20 years or so have been emerging that look at that sort of contribution rather than direct causal attribution. But again, um, they're very reliant on developing a good theory of change for what is it, how do you, how do you believe missions work? And getting into the detail, like how do they change behaviors? How do that behavioral change lead to different outcomes? And when you break open that sort of, you want to look into the detailed design of missions, often the principles are very clear, but the real detailed assumptions, not so much granularity, but the very key causal assumptions, we sort of not, you know, we probably could do a better job at um, doing more development and making those more explicit and articulate. Uh, so that's a key barrier. And then Lars touched on this um, in terms of the temporality that um, we definitely, generally in evaluation, still have a across different uh, contexts and in different sectors where we evaluate retrospectively. So sort of look back and say, how well did we do or what did we not do? And that's summative. And there's a shift globally within the evaluation sector and practices about doing more continuous evaluation, which then connects to monitoring. So using evaluation in a regular continuous basis to inform decisions. To do that, you need continuous data collection, reflection, development of those theories and checking. And so you need the people, you need the data infrastructure, you need um, the actual knowledge of how to do continuous evaluation. And here again, that's where we find there's some really great work, but it's something that we're much more uh, nascent and, uh, and emerging on than, than the formative practices. So I, I wanted, I'm not, what's coming now is I'm not giving a solution, but I wanted to give an example of where we have seen an evaluation, one of several that exist, where we have tried to combine um, our, our engagement with those challenges into a methodology that is systems-based, that is realist. So Lars, um, just you said, so it took a critical realist um, or a realist evaluation approach to developing mechanisms for mission-oriented outcomes. And that actually intentionally um, collected data across a wide range of different outcomes across different sectors. And Rainer, thank you for originally already highlighting it. I've returned for, for just giving one of these examples to um, an evaluation that we at UCL did for the UAE Space Agency. And the context in terms of emissions is that the UAE wants to transform its national economy and basically significantly within a 10 year period develop its science and engineering capabilities. As the action for that, they launched a mission to Mars to sort of 
pull all of the required knowledge infrastructure and skills domestically into that direction and the evaluation therefore had to ask well what was the theory for how this was going to work in detail and what evidence do we have even short term medium term and long term so this is this this evaluation is ongoing of the different types of outcomes we see now i appreciate it's very small on your screen um this sort of picture here with three sections on the on the right but it's that we then uh, took a systems-based approach of looking across different scales and sectors. We mapped out a wide range of different types of outcomes and then did the data collection of multiple types of transformation and are, are continuing that. So really happy to share our, our sort of lessons in terms of how to execute a methodology like that, but also the lessons we're still doing as we're continuing that work uh, together with, with, our, with our local partners. Um, I'll keep this a little bit shorter, but this is now, if that was about the group capabilities and like the methods i really um i'm very passionate about recognizing that all of this in the end comes down to the competencies of humans so our knowledge and our skills and that there aren't some magical missions evaluators out there all sway to them to sort of come in and do it actually um much of our work has been working with people who work as evaluators in public administrations and who then get tasked to do missions evaluation um, and in studying what their um not only what their sort of existing competencies are, but their familiarity with some of these emerging theory-based evaluations, systems-based evaluations, and some of the linked competencies, um, sort of find three areas that are challenging and that require action. One is that to do cross-sectoral holistic evaluation, you work with different types of data and you need different types of methods. And that actually through the professionalization of people who go into public policy analysis, we find that each individual tends to sort of um, have historically been excluded from, for example, we see people who've come through more the sociological evaluation and socio like social evaluation tracks, who then don't have the um, sort of typical statistical econometric impact evaluation skill sets that you would expect for holistic evaluation and vice versa. Um, in terms of the methods and familiarity, missions evaluation requires methodologies like contribution analysis and realist evaluation, and the current levels of familiarity with that in the sort of general policy evaluation uh, communities are um, relatively low. Uh, here is some very untidied data of three different um, competency studies with three different policy groups. You can see the numbers at the bottom, uh, a group of over 200, one agency with 10 evaluators and another um, with about just over 20. And, and the main thing here to note is that um, if it were blue on the screen, people would feel they had really great uh, levels of confidence in working with a wide range of evaluation methods. But even those who are tasked with the evaluation, we repeatedly in different contexts are still seeing that people sort of self-report very low levels of confidence with theory-based evaluation, mixed methods, um, uh, uh, realist evaluation. And so uh, sort of a snapshot um, of what we've been encountering. And the third is that um, that coupled capabilities is that we then find that when we run training programs or we work with partners to try and like develop those evaluation skills that people share with us that actually when it comes to how do I judge the quality of subjective data how do I work with mixed method, mixed, mixed data sets how do I do the tidying of things that are very patchy and that are done with delivery partners across a range of different sectors we just have these huge um, gaps in terms of the competencies people have to do what fundamentally is required to do complex evaluation. And so our belief is that programs aimed at doing missions evaluation competency development should have a broad suite of these competencies as part of their curriculum in terms of how they're developed. Um, that's definitely from, from our experience be more successful. And another uh, uh, sort of snapshot that this is very small writing, but um, and they're not all the same, but we've asked people not only what their existing levels of competencies and evaluation specific skills were, but also how, how confident do you feel about regression, about systems mapping, about the collection of data, how it happens. And so we still see a really broad range across different levels of seniority and experience in terms of um, what they have. So in summary, um, how can we transform evaluative missions, uh, evaluative capabilities for missions? Well, there are many challenges, many issues, but taking uh, action that at least bears into mind that action needs to be taken 
aligned across multiple levels and recognizes that evaluation capabilities are connected to data science capabilities, research, data, um, appraisal, judgment, those are required. And that um, what would be really great is to have longitudinal studies of how teams are developing their capabilities in terms of what works and what does not. And I've put a star there because that personally is my primary interest in doing some of this data collection that you've been seeing about what are the competencies, how do they develop over time, and how do they specifically link to institutional capabilities. And I hope that I uh, really look forward to the questions later. And thanks so much, Raina. Thank you so much, Ina. Wonderful presentation. And uh, yes, I think that, as you mentioned, the investment in, in capabilities is actually very rare in public sector in terms of like if there is a new policy approach that requires fundamental changes, public organizations tend not to invest and hope that existing capabilities can deliver. But we'll, we'll come back to that. Thank you very much. And so our last presentation uh, comes today, at least for last presentation comes from Juan Mateos Garcia. Uh, welcome, Juan. Um, um, Juan is a data specialist, uh, data analytics specialist, and innovation in, and innovation in innovation mapping. Apologies. And uh, he worked uh, and led many years in Estas, which is a, one of the leading innovation agencies here in the UK. Uh, Nesta's work around data analytics and, and innovation mapping and teams. And Nesta has done um, very interesting work in this space. And today, Juan will will share his insight. Uh, from that time of his life and uh, today he's working at DeepMind and I'm sure many people would would love to hear your thoughts on DeepMind <laughs> given the given the prevalence of AI in our news stories today but uh, today we talk about uh, evaluation and data analytics so Juan 15 minutes thank you so much for joining us thank you so much um, and I'll be sharing my screen Okay, so can people see that? Yeah, works brilliant. Excellent. So, um, so yeah, uh, thanks so much for having me today. Um, I'm going to be talking about a specific set of methods that I believe can play an important role in informing uh, mission-oriented research and innovation policies. This is data science. This is the kind of thing I was doing um, uh, at Nesta, uh, both um, when I was leading an innovation mapping team there, uh, and also later on when I was leading a data analytics practice that was actually working with Nesta, as a with Nesta acting as a mission-driven innovator in around health education and sustainability. My presentation is going to be a bit more focused on my work around research and innovation policy rather than my work as almost like as a member of a mission-driven innovation agency, but at the end I'll have some reflections on, on the latter as well. So, yeah, I guess um, the way I'm thinking about this is that um, we have a mission-oriented research and innovation policies rely on evidence, and we have an evidence production system that creates that evidence. And, the, and basically the question is whether this evidence production system is able to deliver the evidence that's required by policymakers. Uh, and I guess I think about that in terms of the demand that policymakers have for different types of data uh, and the supply of data and evidence coming from analysts. And very often those analysts are going to be based inside um, policy agencies but uh, they also exist outside and they could be in academia or a lot, a lot uh, that we see in the context of data science and machine learning is uh, analysts uh, and experts who are located in private companies and providing services right, to, to uh, innovation agencies and policymakers. Um, and I guess the issue here is, um, is where uh, the system uh, malfunctions and uh, maybe there's a bit of a systems failure in, in, in this system, uh, which means that we're not able to harness the opportunities uh, to use um, data science and machine learning methods in a way that can help uh, address those po uh, policy evidence needs. Um, and I guess what I'm going to be talking about in the presentation is, um, it's basically based on my work, I guess, as someone who was uh, an analyst but working in the interface uh, with policymakers. Um, 
you know, both what are the, some of the opportunities and, and some of what are some of the challenges. And I guess one thing to say is that um, some of the examples I'm going to be providing are going to be relevant across the policy cycle. So it's not just for evaluation, but actually one of the interesting things about um, both uh, uh, the kind of evidence that's needed for mission oriented innovation policies and, 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 and the kind of data that's provided by data science is that, um, for example, evidence which is relevant for uh, agenda setting or earlier stages of the policy cycle is also going to be relevant uh, for informing evaluation by, for example, creating baselines. So I guess in some ways, some of the uh, boundaries between different stages of the policy, policy cycle dissolve and, and examples which are maybe more focused on one stage are going to be relevant for another. Um, and maybe this, this will get a bit more concrete with some of the examples I'll be, I'll be giving. So, I mean, I'm not gonna dwell on this, just like to say that uh, with um, mission-oriented uh, research and innovation policy, um, I guess has uh, a growing focus on the directionality of innovation uh, and also addressing, I guess, emergence failures uh, um, that prevent societally beneficial uh, innovations from emerging. And we have lots of examples across the world of, of policymakers who want to do this. And we have heard some uh, more in previous uh, presentations. Um, and I guess like the question that I come at is, it's, it's okay, what are the evidence needs for these uh, policies? Um, and I guess the way I, I have framed this uh, is uh, thinking about almost like different activities that take place um, across the policy cycle, you know, and this is using the o ODA kind of like framework. And the idea is that, I guess, policymakers observe the ecosystem, like to understand what's going on. Uh, then based on that perception of the situation, as well as their goals, they orient and, and decide what to do. Then they act, which I guess is kind of like uh, a bit like implementation, and then they learn through this process. And I guess the learning is maybe where a lot of the evaluation would be happening, um, and it, it can be both summative and um, and for or formative. Um, although I guess um, there's a sense, and, and we clearly heard that in the previous presentations, that in the context the context of mission-oriented innovation policies, formative requires more attention. Uh, that maybe it's received in previous um, frames for research and innovation policy based on market failures, for example. Um, okay, so what are the evidence needs uh, at these stages? Um, uh, we want to understand research and innovation inputs, outputs, trajectories, the actors, the networks. We would want to identify what interventions are going to uh, help achieve goals uh, that are linked to the directionality. We would want as much as possible target the uh, um, target the interventions uh, in a way that contributes not just to direct impacts but to change in the system, and obviously thinking a lot about the composition of the portfolio of interventions to avoid this kind of like um, scary um, winner, like um, a picking winners style scenario that um, lots of people complain about in the context of a more activist research and innovation policies. And then finally, yeah, in terms of learning, um, can we look at, uh, understand our impacts, uh, shift the composition of portfolio, shift the interventions and so forth. And so we, we want to have information to inform th that kind of thinking. I guess like the gap that we find, especially when we think about the information that's available from traditional data sources uh, that um, economists and uh, innovation policymakers have used for decades, is that very often we lack uh, information around emerging activities and network structures, the usual kind of cliche that um, uh, existing taxonomies of industries of technologies only capture whatever existed when the technology was established. Uh, so anything that's new is difficult to capture, but very often mission-oriented innovation policies are creating new things or harnessing new things. Um, when thinking about how to orient and decide, very often we were missing key features of the research and innovation system. So, and we were not picking up the features, like almost the outcomes we want to achieve. How are we going to understand the drivers? Um, very often aggregated data, like for example, 
the kind of data you could see in a um, European uh, innovation index or things like that is very aggregate. It's at the level of countries. It's at the level of like the whole economy. Uh, it's at the level of big sectors like manufacturing or services. And that makes it very difficult to target because um, very often in order to target, you want to understand almost like the prospects of an individual actor or an individual community or an individual very kind of like specific industry or, or, or area of knowledge. Uh, and then in, the, in terms of uh, learning, I guess, with existing evidence, it can be quite hard to match on observables. For example, how do you compare like a, a company that participated with one that didn't when so much of what's going to determine if a company is successful or, or not is intangible? Um, uh, uh, and also, obviously, we have very laggy measures of impact, like um, uh, research funded generates technologies that are launched in the market that create an economic impact or change the, 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 the structure of the innovation system or create a health impact. These things can take decades. And, and the question is, how can we start to get some evidence now about the impact that the policy is having so that we can uh, learn from that and, and, and uh, I guess, operate in a more agile way? Um, so I guess like some of the new opportunities coming from data science and, and machine learning, you know, and, and I guess I have, I don't have a definition a slide with definitions here, but I guess let's just think about new types of data, especially things like text data, network data, and algorithms that we use to analyze this data to extract some insight from them, from them and make, uh, uh, create maps and make predictions. That's what I'm talking about. We can use it to identify emerging and unusual uh, areas of activity. We can map networks and understand their structure. We can uh, use this information to build explanatory and predictive models of policy relevant outcomes. We could, uh, um, I guess, map um, the capabilities of actors at a high level of resolution, or even think about how we can personalize interventions um, based on that. We can also look, for example, at the position of actors within networks and, 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 and think about, okay, if we intervene here, what could be the impact not just on the actor, but on the structure of the network um, and its connectivity. And then also like, we can use this kind of information for learning, both because we are capturing uh, outcomes at the systems level, uh, and we can track that over time and, and, and monitor it. But also at the level of individual actors and interventions, we can create better baselines. We can analyze the activities of actors or their outputs in order to try to get a sense of uh, the, its directionality and whether it's taking us in a pathway towards impact. Like for example, analyzing research that happens uh, to understand whether it's linked to a specific uh, health outcomes we're interested in or specific sustainable development goals or whatever. It's not yet a product in the market that's causing an impact, but if the research is in an area that we want to support and we are interested in, hopefully this is telling us that we are going in that direction of eventually having an impact. And then, as I said, monitor evolution of network structures and, and other systemic uh, features of the, yeah, of the innovation system that we care for. And, and yeah, um, hopefully we are able to measure a bit better how they are uh, responding to interventions. So. Um, and yeah, I guess like one thing that's interesting here is that semantic analysis help us bridge the gap between quantitative and qualitative because we have a big corpus of research, for example, or technology activities. We can analyze this using semantic methods like natural language processing, things like that, to generate statistics which are quantitative. But we also have the qualitative data that we can analyze uh, in order to get a very kind of like uh, concrete sense of what's going on. Um, okay, so I have uh, three examples and I'm going to be quick because I only have five minutes and I also have time to talk about implications. Um, but yeah, yeah, some examples of work we did uh, that's relevant for this and maybe illustrate some of the possibilities is work we did um, in the UK, looking at uh, mission oriented research and innovation policies here, uh, like for example, a government mission to use AI to tackle chronic diseases. Uh, and, and basically what we did was analyze funding data to understand and, and basically analyze funding data using semantic methods to identify research about AI, research about chronic diseases, uh, what's happening in the intersection, how is this evolving over time, uh, what is the interdisciplinarity of the research that's happening, is it more influenced by computational uh, uh, disciplines or biomedical and life sciences disciplines, 
how diverse is this activity, um, what topics are being pursued in what disease areas and where are the gaps, and also who's intervening, who's funding this research, um, uh, and how's this evolving over time. And there's a paper uh, here, it's just a link in the presentation that you can check if you're interested in getting into the details. Um, another example of like work we did is in a European project where we uh, use these semantic methods to uh, analyze the response to COVID-19 in the EU. Uh, and I guess in this context, um, I guess in a way the response to COVID-19 was almost like a mission. Uh, and we wanted to understand both what was happening uh, um, in real time, but also what had the Commission done historically that might be contributing to better resilience and preparedness now. And basically what we did was um, cluster um, all of their uh, grants based on uh, their abstracts using semantic methods. And basically we analyzed the, the, um, not, not just what they were doing now, but also like their funding of um, research in different areas that would be relevant for COVID historically. Uh, like for example, research around biotechnology, uh, policy, public health systems and, and resilience and things like that. And then also we looked at the citations received by all of this historical work uh, from the current COVID response in order to understand how this historical investment on societal resilience was paying off now. Um, and also like something we did here was to um, to basically look at uh, the extent to which the participation of different countries in EU funded research historically uh, in each of these different areas that would be relevant for COVID were actually uh, being uh, reflected in more participation of leadership now which is almost like a, trying to get a sense of whether these countries have been developing absorptive capacities uh, through participation in EU funded projects that made them better able to respond to the COVID emergency when it happened. And, and we have a lot of analysis looking at that as well. And I'm, I'm not going to, try to explain this complicated chat now, but uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of trying to pick up that idea of uh, building how participation in, in EU research has helped build his, like capabilities that have been useful to tackle COVID down the line. Um, yeah, so just three examples, uh, very quick ones. Uh, obviously, we can discuss them more if you're interested. But uh, I guess uh, what I wanted to conclude with is by talking a bit about, OK, if this is so great. If there are so many opportunities to use data science, what are some of the barriers for bringing this into the mainstream of, um, of um, mission-oriented policies and, and research and innovation policies? I guess uh, we find some gaps to do with lack of policy knowledge um, um, among the analysts um, and maybe sometimes difficulties answering the so what question, lack of technical knowledge across policymakers, sometimes people confusing a bit measuring KPIs versus developing evidence of impact. Um, data analytics very often delivering discrete projects uh, rather than um, the kind of like continuous evidence base that policymakers need policymakers funding prototypes rather than funding the development of infrastructure that is required to generate this evidence in a real time way, way and being able to use it as it emerges um, rather than a situation where you um, basically um, you realize when you need the evidence that you don't have the, 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 the evidence and in order to access the evidence you need the infrastructure but it takes time to build the infrastructure so the evidence takes time to arrive and then finally, like uh, there's a lot of like opacity, like people not sharing code, not sharing data, and maybe lo lots of like lack of evidence about the experiments that policymakers are running that um, uh, might uh, be useful for others who are thinking about how to do this well. Um, I have some like recommendations for policies I'm not going to get into now for lack of time. I don't want to overrun. And yeah, just to conclude, um, I think like data science and machine learning can bridge the gap between qualitative and quantitative and formative and summative, help us to consider systemic impacts. Um, need to think about how we use this to integrate descriptive um, uh, evidence, predictive evidence and explanatory evidence. Also, how do we bring RCTs here as a method that might help us to understand the impact that, in, uh, that interventions have on measures which are 
relevant for a mission-oriented policy, like for example on health, which can be difficult to pick up using traditional um, science, technology, and innovation indicators. And I guess super important, and also in and picked on this, like the importance of going beyond discrete projects to be technical infrastructure to collect data and analyze data, but also social infrastructure collaboration between uh, policymakers and other actors in the ecosystem uh, that can help them to adopt these methods. And yeah, I guess ultimately, if we help to bridge some of these uh, gaps, I feel that there's a lot of scope for new, impactful, and inclusive policies uh, that uh, are conducive to societal progress. And yeah, that's. Me, thank you very much, and sorry for overrunning a bit. No worries, thank you so much, Shawan. And uh, yeah, so we have heard uh, all three presentations. Uh, I think there's a really interesting uh, landscape out there and a lot of things to discuss. I see there is uh, people are, are asking uh, quest questions in the chat and asking for more information. So that's great. That's the entire idea. So, um, and I think we want to do now with uh, 15 minutes or so, we have three, two things actually. Well, first, uh, Virgie will, will post a, a link to the chat so that everybody can go to that chat, uh, to that link and uh, put their own um, sort of keywords in. So at the end, we will we'll look at that. But first, I, I would like to um, uh, discuss some of the questions that we have. I think we can start with, with Lars. Uh, you might have seen in the Q&A function, there was one specifically around uh, climate cities. Uh, so if you if you would like to... So the question is, um, you know, the top-down and place-based inter place interventions and the, uh, the sort of the freedom to operate within the mission. So go ahead, take this one. Yeah, thank, thanks for this question. Um, in a sense, I mean, uh, I think an, an, an important sort of observation um, that, that I would like to sort of put forward is this, um, this idea that, um, monitoring and evaluation practices and techniques are pluralizing. Um, so it's not like there's a, 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 a new sort of gold standard for, for missions, but more that you need to sort of monitor and evaluate more holistically. And um, sort of the monitoring and evaluation practices should sort of serve the purpose of specific stakeholders. And I think that, that it can really be nicely illustrated um, in the answer to your question, uh, in the sense that um, um, Vinova um, is still uh, also sort of employing their sort of traditional, more summative um, evaluation methods um, on, on viable cities. Um, because they, they 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 are interested in you know to what extent does this really generate innovation um, you know business startups etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, so, but um, in that sort of pluralizing um, development um, stakeholders such as cities uh, basically were not satisfied with that approach um, because it did not serve their purpose in terms of wanting to learn about um, how do we you know, transition our cities to, to climate neutrality. So um, and in that sense, they were given free hands to sort of design, develop, negotiate um, other ways of monitoring and evaluation um, that would serve the objectives, targets, and um, ambitions, missions, as were sort of formalized in sort of the more granular, uh, place-based, place-specific uh, climate city contracts, right? So again, I think I think this has been a, a theme, um, both in Ina and my talk. Um, it's important to sort of uh, acknowledge the, the, the multi-level governance landscape and um, stakeholders at a, a more micro level have different stakes in terms of what they want to get out of monitoring and evaluation compared to say um, more macro level uh, uh, stakeholders. But uh, that sort of pluralization um, kind of allows for coexistence as well. 
And, and at the same time, I think this kind of goes a bit to Juan's point. Uh, it is also important to kind of make sure that these sort of different repertoires, if you like, of monitoring and evaluation uh, try to keep on commuting, communicating with, with them, with each other, so that it does not kind of become um, sort of uh, fragmented. Mm -hmm. So I hope that, that answered your question. Thanks. Thanks so much. And I think there is maybe um, one uh, like a comments, and then let me phrase it as a question for Ina and one both. I think is a is around the evaluation and the methodologies and tools, you know, um, and capabilities and, and data for different kinds of mission. I think Wolfgang Polt has, uh, has put here in some comments in the Q and A around. You know, some missions can be much more of an accelerator type, so they're might, might not perhaps as transformative. But they try to accelerate current existing sort of technological trajectories and then others are much more transformative and they demand like a bigger behavioral change maybe around food for instance but maybe if you think about sort of renewable energy we sort of know where we're going and and then so I, I would like to ask both of you whether you know from one whether that is the does it does it matter if the mission is more radical more ambitious what kind of data we can use uh, all of those and for Ina, the same question about capabilities. I think that's what uh, Wolfgang was um, uh, was hinting at, whether we, you know, there are some missions that we know sort of how to evaluate because we have done something similar in the past, they were very much technology related, but other missions, like many EU missions at the today are much more open-ended uh, and perhaps transformative in their nature. So yeah, however you want to take this question, sorry for punching it a bit, but <laughs> I get, hope you understood. I'm happy to have a, a first contribution point if you're happy. Yeah. Um, I, there's so many parts of that question. So I part of my first reaction is I I don't think I I don't think that distinction almost matters. I think all evaluation and forward-looking evaluation, so the preparation for that, I think needs to expect there to be outcomes that were not anticipated nor intended. So all perceptions of what will be evaluated ideally are prepared to open themselves up to actually collect um, observations, lived experiences of what is both expected, but also unexpected and undesired. Um, Lars made this point because evaluation is not only for reporting on what we achieved, but about so that we enable ourselves to learn about what we might want to change, not only to increase the benefits to the multiple people who should benefit from missions, but also to be able to have um, feedback on how we're maybe causing harm or potential losses. And so um, if that's the principle that actually even if we think we know something very well, how it historically performed is very unlikely in an increasingly interconnected complex world to work in the same way. So I think all evaluation should expect the, to, to see the unexpected. Then the how to do that in an ideal, we have a really well-established cross-cutting infrastructure, which Juan, you beautifully articulated as a technical and social infrastructure. Lars, you similarly talked about the participatory nature of future evaluation. And so, um, I think if that's the principle, then the practice is, I just think that so much of this missions evaluation is about better policy evaluation infrastructure, where we need that like data architecture, the thinking about what kinds of data and what's proportionate. So the ideal could require endless resources, the judging of what is like a minimum shared baseline set of data points that multiple missions can benefit from, that takes a particular type of national coordination that is needed, or international even. Thanks, uh, Juan. Thanks so much, Ine, for for going first and letting me uh, give me some time to put my thoughts in order because it's a really it's a really big question. And I guess what I ended up I was thinking a bit about how these methods could contribute um, at different stages of the policy cycle. And, and let's think about like a massively transformative uh, research in innovation policy like almost like a transition style policy that wants to change our almost like cultural attitudes and about like a certain uh, uh, phenomenon. Uh, so I think like then the methods I was talking about, data science, machine learning could, could help at each stage. 
you know, could help in terms of like when we're thinking about observing and engaging, like what communities to involve, who needs to be part of the conversation, like how to identify key actors. Um, I think uh, um, even, even if the solutions that we are looking for don't yet exist, because the program is looking to generate those, those solutions, we can still, still use these methods to try to identify almost like people who are involved in technologies or systems which are potential components of the solution. So we can do that. Um, then in terms of like um, deciding to support different solutions and interventions, obviously there's like a massive literature on how you use uh, data science, machine learning methods like these to capture the novelty of, um, of, uh, of uh, different ideas. And I guess that's something that we would always want to um, be able to capture and encourage uh, when we are looking for transformative innovation. So it can play a role there as well. And then I guess looking at, uh, at the outputs of this kind of policy and more like the evaluation piece, I guess that's where there's a sense that, um, as Ines said, if you are, are putting in place a very ambitious policy, then we need to be um, very careful with unintended consequences uh, that might come from um, from this type of intervention. How, how, so how do we monitor that in real time? Again, like, like data analytics, data science can play a role there. Um, how do we try to measure some of the more um, indirect uh, uh, and intangible types of impacts, like for example, changes in public percep perceptions, changes in culture. Obviously there's a lot of work uh, looking at these uh, around digital humanities. And there's a question about whether those methods can be used. I don't think like ever, never to replace like other qualitative methods, but as a complement and something that can be integrated with them. Which brings me to my final point, which is, um, um, a holistic evaluation of this type of like massively ambitious transformative program is going to require um, holism and combinations of multiple methods and data sources. And I think there are also like data science, machine learning, the digital kind of techniques I am most, I guess, I've worked with can also like help to almost like integrate all of these different things um, and merge them and com combine them and also make them accessible and, and explorable so that uh, the users, like the policymakers, but also like wider society who should have access and be able to see how a policy is impacting on it, uh, is able to explore it, like, for example, through interactive visualizations, dashboards, and things like that. And I guess that's mm -hmm. uh, another way in which this kind of like method can help. Awesome. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, we have two more minutes left. So I want to actually give you each like 30 seconds, maybe, to, to answer my my last question which was inspired by anonymous attendee who asked pretty much the question are there any tools methodologies approaches that we can date from the previous generation of innovation policy evaluations that you would say that they still kind of are kind of useful for missions as well we can still apply them what what would you mention as a methodology so maybe we start again with you Lars. Yeah, thank you. And I, I saw that the, the question specifically referred to the uh, technological innovation yeah. systems uh, and yeah. the function sort of approach to, um, to innovation, innovation policy. Um, so obviously, you know, that specific framework is, is a classic sort of boundary object, uh, a hybrid between second and third generation innovation policy. And um, it, it comes with its, you know, it, it, it pros and cons because on the pro side, you would be able to work with sort of proven concepts, uh, proven techniques, proven indicators, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the, the caveat is, however, that um, what I see is that, you know, that the, the list of functions seems to re remain unquestioned. And, and, and that sort of then, um, runs into trouble in terms of, you know, the point about, you know, it is not only about sort of achieving missions as sort of, you know, that missions are set in stone, but missions also need to be contested. So in that sort of learning journey, um, you, you might discover uh, that, you know, there are other functions you need to sort of pay attention to. 
Uh, and I see that a lot of that work on, on, on the drawing on the TIS approach very sort of quickly just sort of, um, yeah, uh, reuses the, the famous sort of seven functions. So with some qualification and adaptation, I would say yes. Okay, uh, one. Sorry, I was looking for the unmute. I, I, I mentioned this one before, and, and maybe it's a bit of, um, um, it's uh, idealistic to say that this was a feature of previous method, previous like uh, innovation policy frames, which is randomized control trials. Right. Um, because no one, you know, it's, they are not like in the mainstream still of research and innovation policy in the way in which they are in other fields. But um, like, let's just think of them as one of the methods that's used in the context of mainstream research and innovation policy, so it could be used. And I guess that's where I feel um, they could play a very important role in mission-oriented innovation policies, especially if we are able, because we are able to deploy them in a context where they generate data about the outcomes that interest us. Like for mm -hmm. example, a mission to tackle health, a mission to tackle public perceptions uh, around sustainability or even behaviors around sustainability we can actually think of experiments not just as a tool to evaluate the impact of um, mission-oriented innovation policy in that area, but also as a way to generate data about mm -hmm. outcomes which are quite difficult to pick up from other existing sources. So I'll just be very uh, thrad <laughs> and mention that one. Okay, last but not least, Ina. Um, three bullets. So the first, I put a little bit in the chat, but the first is, I I'm not a cynic, but I'm just very wary of any anything that's led with a method before the uh, purpose of the like the problem. Not that anyone here is doing that, but I think so. So I'm always a bit hesitant to highlight favorite methods or um, so that's one. The second is any. Yes, I think why reinvent the wheel? Like if we already have theories that seem to be better fitting, uh, we can reuse. But I would be suspicious of anything that isn't then further adapted because the world has changed and we have learned more. And a third would be that the greatest reusability is in the data that was developed of those previous evaluations of, for example, transitions or in what we have from RCT, trial, like randomized control trials elsewhere, and that we don't have access to that. So if the perception is, oh, this data exists, it may do, but it's not accessible for the for, for, for not even us, but anyone. So um, finding ways to give access to the data is key for any of that reusability, I think. Awesome, thank you so much. I uh, couldn't agree more. Uh, so, I, uh, Virgie, you can share the vertical out, vertical out that we heard back from the participants. And uh, as you're sharing your screen, uh, yeah, so, yeah, so it's an interestingly replicability is in the in the center of that. But there is lots of other uh, lack of capabilities. So there is an entire sort of segment around capabilities, obviously. And, and I think there is really interesting challenge here, probably when we think about, because all of you, what, what all of you said actually is, you know, this idea of methodologies and adaptability at community data, there's, there is a maybe like almost like some sort of a new profession emerging around actually evaluating, not just sort of, you know, quantitative or using various, you know, cost benefit based simple theories and methodologies, but actually in, enlarging the diversifying and that you know it's, it's probably not only a, a, a one profession, but it's like diversity, diversified teams around uh, evaluation, which is I think is super interesting. And hopefully we, we can continue with all of you who are today here in, in a month's time in the next session where we have again uh, then more driven by practitioners. And uh, so today we have like academically reflected but brilliant academics. All of you have have done really exciting work, and I was really happy to have you here. And some of you haven't seen for a while, so old friends, very good to see you. <laughs> and uh, and to make new acquaintances, of course, as well. And uh, as you might have seen from the chat, we have people from from Australia to Africa to, to UK and, and all over the place. So thank you very much and hope to see you very soon. And I would really like to thank our speakers and our organizing team behind the scene, Virgie, Barbara, Victoria. Well done, everybody. And I hope you have a great day and see you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye.